Hello everyone and welcome to another Florida Native Plant Society Lunch and Learn. I'm really pleased to have Eugene Kelly, our Policy and Legisla Legislation Chair here for our second Policy and Legislation Update. We're going to make this a regular update to our members and of course we're going to make these public uh, so that everybody can see what we're working on um, as far as preserving, preserving and conserving and restoring and the native, the native plants and native plant communities of Florida using policy as a tool. So without further ado, here is Gene. Thank you very much, Valerie. I'm glad to be here with everybody. As Valerie mentioned, we're going to, we're planning to make this a, a regular thing to provide these kinds of updates. I guess it was back in July that I last uh, gave a lunch and learn presentation that was kind of a, a wrap up of the legislation legislative session that had just concluded. Um, and we we shared the highlights of that and and some of the other uh, priorities and initiatives for our committee. Uh, this is now going to be kind of a preview for 2023. Uh, a lot of what we do in our committee is related to the Florida legislature and, and the laws that they pass. Uh, we like to promote good legislation and, and fight against what we consider to be bad legislation. Uh, so I, I'll, there really isn't any legislation that I can share with you as of yet, because you know we just had an election and, and that's all gonna be coming together, but I can tell you what our priorities are at this point that that could change depending on on future circumstances that we really can't predict um i do have a list here of all the members on the policy committee and just as a reminder to you we do have our very own lobbyist sue mullins and uh just to take a quick look back at the election uh, Governor DeSantis was reelected. I don't think that's a surprise to any of you that uh, uh, this is pretty widely known news. Uh, but other noteworthy things that came out of the election, Wilton Simpson, who for the last two years had been president of the Florida Senate, was elected uh, as the new commissioner of agriculture, uh, replacing Nikki Freed. Uh the Republican Party did win some additional seats in the legislature to the point that they now have a super majority in both the House and the Senate. Uh, one thing that means is that there's enough of them that they could override a veto of a bill if the if they passed a bill that uh, Governor DeSantis chose to veto. Uh, they wouldn't need any uh, votes from the minority party, the Democrats. Uh, there, there will be some uh, additional impacts that those supermajorities have in, in terms of the committee business. Um, we have a new Senate president in Kathleen Pasadomo and a new Speaker of the House of Representatives in Paul Renner. So they will be the legislative leadership uh, for the next two years, the next two legislative sessions. And... Uh, this video the graphic that I've shown before, the uh, the parties, you know, we, we like to think that there will be some comedy, some uh, working across the aisle. Uh, we can hope for that. But again, uh, the the misbalance, if you will, in, in the state legislature is such that the minority party uh, may not be able to have much of an impact. Here's a, a list of the priorities as I see them right now for the coming year. Uh, funding for land conservation through Florida Forever and the Rural of Family Lands. Every year, that's a priority we have. And uh, it, we can feel pretty pretty good about how things have gone the last couple of years after about a, a decade of, of some pretty tough years where there wasn't much, if any, funding for land conservation. Water quality continues to be one of our big concerns. It has been for the last several years and continues to be. We'll talk a little more about that. Uh, we were also supportive of legislation that passed 
a couple of years ago that established a lot of funding, uh, over half a billion dollars worth for uh, resiliency to respond to coastal flooding. I'll talk a little bit about that. Oklawaha River restoration has been a priority for a couple of years now and continues to be. We're real hopeful uh, that we're going to see some some good progress on that. And we also really want to do what we can to support uh, more effective advocacy by our chapters and membership outside of the work that we do as a policy committee. And some of the ways we do that is through the policy advocacy handbook that we put out in 2019. We want to look at that for some possible updates. And, and when I say we reissue it, it's there for anybody to download from our website, uh, but we do just want to bring it back to everybody's attention so that they know it's out there as a resource for their use. We also develop policy statements uh, to help really frame what our positions are on various issues and why. We think it's important to, to put together those kinds of formal uh, statements and, and analyses, again, as a way for the membership to understand where the Native Plant Society stands and why on some of these big issues. So we haven't developed any policy statements in a number of years, and we want to go ahead and get, get active in that again as a committee. Uh, some of the policy statements that we don't have that we, we think would be very useful would be uh, one that looks at climate change, Another that would look at water resources, both water quantity and water quality. It makes sense since water resources every year are a, a, a major issue for us. And also land use issues. Uh, we don't just work at the, at the state level. Uh, and so th there is federal legislation that we are supportive of. Uh, the Invasive Species Prevention and Forest Restoration Act. Uh, so we're we're going to try to be engaged on that and see what we can do to help get it passed through U.S. Congress. Uh, one bit of good news on that is that uh, over the last several months, with assistance from Valerie, uh, Representative Darren Soto, who represents District 9, I guess it is, in the Orlando area, has signed on as a co-sponsor of that particular bill. To that point in time, uh, the state of Florida, our, our uh, congressional delegation, did not include any sponsors of this bill. So that was a very encouraging uh, piece of news. Thank you, Va Valerie, for helping make that happen. Very just look back uh, uh, at last year, some of the results that we liked, we did get significant funding for land conservation, $400 million. There was a bill passed that addressed septic tank inspections. And as, it, as it's described here, that authorized the owner of a septic tank to hire a private provider to perform an inspection and authorized DEP to audit some of those providers just to see what they could uh, learn from that data uh, about the performance of of septic tank systems in the state. It's it's a pretty minor, what we would call incremental step, and we're hoping to see something more ambitious this year. I already mentioned we were supportive of the funding that the the state has provided for uh, resilience projects to address coastal flooding and sea level rise related impacts. They, they took some additional steps in that last session that established a statewide office of resilience. That's part of the, the office of the governor. Uh, and it, it, it resulted in the appointment of a chief resilience officer. Uh, some of the things that that it also required is an action plan for the state highway system, a report from DEP on flood resilience and mitigation efforts, the, those kinds of projects that they're funding with that half billion dollars, 
and uh, it expanded eligibility for uh, ap applicants for those resilient Florida grants. Uh, this this is another slide that came from the update we gave you in in July. Uh, some of the budget numbers that that we think really paint uh, the results of that last legislative session. So under land conservation, there's some big numbers there: 100 million for Florida Forever, 300 million for rural and family lands grants, or excuse me, easements. Uh, that particular program, we'll talk a little more about that, is administered by the Florida Department of Agriculture. And then the, the, the bottom half, you see a, a lot of other big numbers related to uh, those resiliency projects. So the state really has invested heavily in, in that resiliency program. Another positive piece of news, uh, back in July, we were, uh, we gave you an update on our efforts as part of the No Roads to Ruin Coalition to stop the Northern Turnpike extension. That was basically what remained of uh, the MCORS project that proposed three new major toll roads through the state. And so this was the, the the road that would have extended the turnpike northward from its current terminus to somewhere uh, with US-19. The good news is that we were successful. Uh, the Department of Transportation ended their work on that project. And that really was a direct result of the work that we did as, as part of the No Roads to Ruin coalition uh, to convince local governments that this wasn't something they wanted to be a part of. So uh, by the time it, it was over, Levy County and Citrus County, the two main counties that would have been impacted by the road, had both passed resolutions opposing this proposed highway, as did a number of the other local governments that I have listed there. Uh, the real clincher was uh, when Citrus County uh, signed their resolution and submitted it to FDOT. That was like the the last straw. And within a couple of weeks of that, DOT basically said they were pausing the project. Uh, we'll keep our eyes and ears open. You never know, it might come back. This was probably the fourth time in the last 30 years that, that an extension of the turnpike was proposed. But that was really a big win. Uh, for the Native Plant Society and, and for Florida environment. So that's the end of the Northern Perm Turnpike Extension, we hope, at least for the foreseeable future. Going through that list of priorities, uh, funding for land conservation, uh, we're hoping that we will see more funding for Florida Forever and the Rural and Family Lands Program. Uh, we, we received $400 million last year, $400 million the prior year. And what we'd really been fighting for since uh, 2007, uh, when the recession hit and Florida Forever funding just completely dried up, we were hoping for the day when we would see historic funding levels of $300 million a year return to that program. And so that's what we've seen the last couple of years. Although I would have to say that uh, the $400 million that was dedicated to land conservation this year, uh, I mentioned it briefly when we had that uh, uh, list from the, from the budget that was approved last year, but only 100 million actually goes to Florida Forever projects and 300 million goes to rural and family lands program conservation easements. And those are easements that are designed to protect agricultural lands, primarily ranches and uh, uh, forestry lands uh, where timber is grown and harvested. And uh, of course, it, it, it is supposed to complement Florida forever 
uh, by protecting agricultural lands that also have some natural resource values, help maintain connectivity and buffer existing conservation lands. Um, it is important to point out that all the funding for land conservation this year and last year, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it all came from federal funds that were part of the COVID relief package that was passed by the U.S. Congress. And so that, uh, that share of Florida's funding is what was used to uh, fund land conservation. And so uh, we'll be as, as enthusiastic this year as we have been in the past to promote funding for land conservation. Uh, we, we might feel a little more optimistic if the $400 million hadn't all been federal money. money. And so we, we are hoping that the state will still fund it. Uh, but from this point forward, you know, it'll it'll have to be the state digging into its own pocketbook. On the water quality issue, uh, it's way past due, as I note here. Um, just some of the signs of the problems we have, all the uh, 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 harmful algal blooms, blue-green algae blooms, red tide, uh, just this Wednesday, uh, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission has announced uh, that they're going to establish a no entry zone in part of the Indian River Lagoon in Brevard County, uh, it, the location where they will be feeding manatees. So for a second winter in a row, they will be feeding manatees. And that's a direct result of the grass beds, the seagrasses in Indian River Lagoon dying uh, from all the nutrient pollution in that system. Uh, so that's just one example. And, and it's an example where an important native plant community, grass beds are, are just being suffocated uh, by polluted waters. Uh, we, we see the same kind of issues with springs. I have a, a couple images here, healthy springs, the top two images. Uh, one is back in the the early days of uh, the Wikiwachi attraction and mermaids, and you can see those pretty healthy grasses. And then the bottom two are more recent images of, that we get from springs. I can't remember who it, it was that said that uh, springs basically offer us a window into the Florida aquifer, where we, we get all our drinking water and provides a lot of the flow and a lot of our rivers and and maintains lake levels. So just another indication of the, the really sad state of affairs when it comes to water quality in Florida. Uh, these are some, uh, some pie charts that I've shown previously. Uh, these came from the basin management action plans for four different Florida springs. And it, they indicate the, the share of nitrogen pollution that comes from various sources. And so the three that you see on top, Wikiwachi, Crystal River, Kings Bay, Wakaiva, uh, the single largest share really comes from septic systems. Another big contributor, and, and probably it, it even exceeds what what nutrients come from septic systems is what comes from urban turf fertilizer and farm fertilizer. Uh, if you put those two together, they they rival septic systems for for in terms of the percentage of the pollution that they cause. And I just want to point out, Rainbow Springs tells a completely different story. If you look at at the situation in that spring shed, almost all the pollution comes from various forms of fertilizer, primarily uh, for supporting agriculture. And the point here is that uh, the solutions to dealing with this problem vary according to where you are in the state of Florida. 
So there's no one size fits all solution. And one of the concerns we have, uh, continuing here to look at Rainbow Springs, and this this is an image that I I've borrowed from the Florida Springs Council. They did an analysis of basin management action plans uh, to see the kinds of projects that they were funding and how far that would go towards the goal of restoring water quality in our spring systems. So you see here that uh, pie chart on the upper left, agriculture, 61% of the, the nutrient pollution, nitrate pollution in that spring shed. Uh, urban fertilizer is another one. So we're, we're looking at fertilizers being the, the primary issue. Septic systems, about 23%. But then when you look at the kinds of projects that are being funded, uh, it's all about septic and wastewater. That the, the one table there shows you. Uh, 52 million towards wastewater treatment projects, 11 and a half million towards septic systems. Nothing to address the issue of those fertilizers. Uh, and just to put it kind of into perspective, uh, the, the lower right corner there, total nitrate that needs to be removed to meet the water quality goals for that basin, <laughs> uh, 1.7 million pounds. And what these projects that have been implemented, what share of that they're going to address. So we're really concerned that the wrong kinds of projects are being funded uh, to deal with this state's water quality problems. Uh, putting in septic, uh, dealing with, with septic tank issues and wastewater treatment plants in watersheds or spring sheds where agriculture is the problem, it's not going to get you very far. Feeding manatees might be good for a stopgap measure, but that's not going to actually uh, restore the grass beds that have been destroyed uh, by that water pollution. So we're going to be advocating for uh, different kinds of projects. This, this is a report, a summary of the report from the Florida Springs Council, what they think needs to be done uh, in, through the basin management action process. And one of those implement recommendations of the Blue Green Algae Task Force. That's something we've been pushing with the legislature for the last three sessions. Uh, that task force was created by the governor during his first year in office. Uh, they've produced a report. It has a lot of good recommendations. And to this point, uh, they, they have not been implemented. And we're hoping that we will see legislative action this year. So that's that will be one of the main uh, messages that our lobbyists and our committee will be taking to the Florida legislature and to the governor. Uh, in terms of promoting uh, better projects through all that resilience funding, again, here we're looking at the kinds of projects that the state is funding and it, trying to determine whether they're the right kinds of projects. And I really have to do some more analysis on that. Uh, you can find lists of the projects that have been approved and, and you know how much funding has been provided. This, this page just provides an example of some of the projects that have been approved for the 2022-2023 uh, funding cycle through those resilience grants. And I put those green boxes in there just to kind of reflect. We, we have one there. The first one is a living shoreline project. We like those using native plants, nature-based solutions uh, to protect our shorelines, reduce coastal flooding. Uh, and uh, in terms of the funding for that project, it's there's not a whole lot. The, the other projects, pump station, you see there for a $7 million project, a fire station hardening, $6 million project, outfall replacement, $10 million. Uh, what, what I see there, what concerns me is we see a lot more gray infrastructure projects than green infrastructure projects. And we, we need to take a closer look at it so that uh, uh, we describe the situation accurately. But 
just based on a, a surface look, we we really would like to see a greater emphasis on green infrastructure type projects. Oklawaha River restoration is something we've been working on for a couple of years now. We are actively engaged as part of the Free the Oklawaha River Coalition. Uh, Valerie and I, I think we're, we're, we participate in weekly meetings uh, almost without fail. And we have uh, done a lot to really advance that effort. We've we've seen some nice op eds published. Our our uh, well, let me just move along here and actually give you a better sense for what the project is. Uh, some of you might have seen this map before, but the reason we we really support Oklawaha River restoration as a Native Plant Society project when that dam was constructed in 1968 as part of the cross florida barge canal project it flooded and and basically drowned 7500 acres of floodplain forest under the rodman reservoir it drowned 20 natural springs uh, and it's also robbed the saint john's river of quite a bit of flow. It's estimated now that just breaching the dam and allowing the, the river, the Oklawaha, to flow freely, and it is the largest single tributary to the St. John's River, it would restore at least 150 million gallons a day of additional flow to that river, which would be very good for the St. John's River, for its water quality, and, and to deal with sea level rise and saltwater intrusion up that river. One of the most exciting things that we were able to do as part of that coalition, uh, Sue Mullins, our lobbyist, uh, she, she connected uh, the leaders of the Free the Oklawaha River Coalition with Florida Tax Watch and convinced them that they should really take a look at this project in terms of uh, fiscal responsibility, that's that's really kind of their uh, their focus. Their bailiwick is to uh, judge how how fiscally prudent uh, the state of Florida is, and they they did an an analysis and they ended up completely supporting uh, the restoration option. It's also worth noting, as we say here, the dam is past its lifespan. It was built in 1968. The Barge Canal project was deauthorized by President Nixon just a couple of years later. And yet we still live with the remnants of, of that dam, which really serves no purpose, but now is a threat to uh, the downstream town of Wilaka, which... Uh, would probably see a lot of damage if that dam ever failed, which again, it's past its lifespan. So we're hoping uh, that, that we will finally see the legislature take some action. Uh, we've had some in indications that the governor will very likely be supportive of this project. It went a long way towards convincing them when they saw that tax watch study. Uh, there were also a couple surveys that were conducted to gauge public opinion. And uh, back a couple decades ago, there were a, a lot of people, especially in the local area, that supported retaining the reservoir uh, because they saw a lot of value in recreational fishing and it, it injected some money into the local economies. But now, more recent surveys have shown that 75% uh, even of the local residents in Putnam and Marion counties support restoration. And some of the other benefits, uh, we mentioned the problems manatees are, are having starving in the Indian River Lagoon. That's because they're searching out for uh, the warm water refugia they need in the winter. And again, removing that dam would restore unfettered access to 20 natural springs uh, to Florida manatees. We'd also see a lot of uh, 
uh, restoration benefit to native plant communities. 7,500 acres of floodplain forest would be restored. Uh, 20 natural spring run systems would be restored. And there are a number of uh, imperiled plant species that are dependent on those kinds of systems. I, I put a couple of them here, species that we expect uh, would benefit from removing that dam and restoring those 20 natural spring systems. Sorry about the phone ringing in the background. Um, and... I can put on the music. Oh, no, he's back. <laughs> uh, this was some interesting uh, images that I, I found. Uh, Cannon Spring is one of the springs that uh, would be restored. Uh, if the dam is breached and the reservoir drained. Yeah, what, the image on the left is Cannon Spring when the, the dam is, is closed and the reservoir is full. Every few years, in order to maintain some kind of viability in that reservoir, they do a drawdown. And when they do that, those springs reemerge. And so the, the image you see on the right is a canoeist who's approached the spring uh, during one of those drawdowns. Uh, you might, uh, if you look at the trees in the background in that opening, where, where you're, you're looking at the same spot in both these images and you can see the blue water of that, of that spring boil. And uh, uh, we'd be really anxious to see those stream systems uh, restored. Another interesting uh, issue there. I mentioned 150 million gallons of additional flow to uh, the St. John's River every day by breaching the dam. Uh, the St. John's River Water Management District has demonstrated that uh, spring flow from these 20 drowned springs is almost non non-existent when the, the reservoir is full, but during the drawdown, it releases the hydraulic pressure, the weight of all that water, and all of a sudden, uh, the spring flow rebounds again. So there, there's water quality and water quantity benefits to this, in addition to restoring a lot of native plant communities. We do want to help chapters and members be better able to engage in, in advocacy on, on behalf of uh, native plant issues in, the, in their local communities. I mentioned the policy advocacy handbook that we developed in 2019 that you can download from the website. Uh, we want to update and re, reissue that, bring to everybody's attention that it, it is available there as a resource and develop some additional policy statements that we believe could help uh, equip members to be better able to go out and advocate in their local communities. And uh, again, uh, we, we want to lobby in support of the Invasive Species Prevention and Forest Restoration Act. So those, those are the big picture priorities that, that we, we see uh, for 2023. But again, uh, there are almost certainly going to be some bills that come out uh, that we don't like. <laughs> there are every year. And the, the amount of uh, attention and energy we might have to devote to those, uh, it, it, it could make uh, it difficult to pursue some of our other priorities. There could be things coming out of left field, out of right field, that's one of the uh, exciting and uh, disturbing things about the legislative session. Things can move a mile a minute and uh, and you never really know for sure what's coming. There's one other thing I wanted to bring to everybody's attention. And what is the Homegrown National Park? I'm not sure how many of you might be familiar with this project. It was started by Doug Tallamy. He's a professor of entomology at the University of Delaware. It might be a name you recognize. 
He's kind of a hero of, of native plant enthusiasts nationwide. Uh, you might have his book, Bringing Nature Home, on your bookshelf. He's, he's published additional books since that one. And what this, he's a, a co-founder of the Homegrown National Park Project. And what, it, what, he, what they're doing here is uh, they're promoting the use of native plants in landscaping of home sites. And they have a goal of promoting uh, 20 million acres of native plantings in the United States on people's home sites, which will represent about half the area that is now uh, that now accounts for lawn. Um, you can go to their website, homegrownnationalpark.org, to learn more about it and ideally to register your yard. So here's a map that I downloaded from the website. It's 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 a nationwide project, national park, and uh, I what I did here I zeroed in on Florida, and those those little icons you see are clusters of home sites that have been registered in Florida. Uh, it's a totally voluntary thing to to enter your property. I would share that right now, Florida is ranked 35th in terms of representation out of the 50 states. I'd like to see us do a lot better than that. We've got 750 plantings or home sites registered, accounting for a grand total of 679 acres. Now, maybe some have been added in the last week or so since I created this slide, uh, but that's still accounts for 0.0% of Florida. We're, we're a state of 40 million acres and only 679 acres have been uh, registered thus far as, as part of the homegrown national park. That big red icon that you see around no north of Tampa Bay, that's my home site. Uh, when you, when you're, you register your property and you go into the, the site, you log in, uh, it, it will show you where your particular uh, home site is. So that's me, my two and a half acres. I registered about a year ago, and I'm I'm really hoping that the Native Plant Society and our members will get behind this effort. Now, uh, it's a much improved process and and mapping system, and so I'm I'm really hoping that some of you out there. Uh, will share with your other, your fellow native plant enthusiasts, members of your chapter, maybe maybe your individual chapter uh, will, will make it a point of pride to see uh, everybody register their homes and make them part of this homegrown national park. Uh, I purchased a number of these yard signs, that one that you see here on this page. Uh, I haven't Put it out in front of my my house yet i just received it in the mail but you can you can download a template for that and and create your own sign that way i'm hoping again it's something that you'll all get on board totally voluntary it doesn't commit you to anything but it it really could be an effective way of making everybody more aware of the value of native plants uh, for birds and people and insects, pollinators. I wanted to allow plenty of time for, for questions and answers. I'd, I'd like to hear from you about, you know, maybe there's something that's not on our radar that you think should be. Uh, if you're a member of the Native Plant Society, then we are your policy and legislation committee. And uh, if, 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 if you don't have an opportunity to, to share it with me now, any kinds of questions or recommendations, you can reach me at the email address listed here, fnps.policy at fnps.org. Uh, I'd also mention, as I did during our July update, that if you do not receive action alerts that we issue, uh, then you're not on our list. We don't send them to to, to our members unless they 
have agreed that they want to receive them. If you do not receive them and want to, then that would be another reason to contact me through that email address to let me know that you would like to be added to the action alert list. Uh, so with that, Valerie, uh, do you have any questions appearing from our members? No questions yet. I did wanna say that I am keeping up with that um, Google form that I made for adding action alert people and people to the action alert list. So I did post that in the chat so they can email you or okay, they can right. just sign up via the form that I posted in the chat. I'll, um, once we're done talking, I'll post it again. Um, oh, we do have a question. Um, well, first, first comment by Jackie K says, thank you for the updates. And then um, Kimberly Gibbs asks if Sue Mullins grew up in Dade City. She sure did. <laughs> yes, she did. The Dade City girl. She's, yeah. she's proud to say that. Uh, Jenny says that she is proudly on the agenda for the Clay County delegation meeting on December 19th. Great. Great. Uh, and one, one thing I would mention is uh, I, Valerie is a busy person, has a very full plate, but one thing we want to try to do is, is put some information out there so our members will know when their legislative delegation is meeting. And I'd, I'd like us to provide some talking points so that if you do address your legislative delegation that you might speak up in support of these issues that we've highlighted, uh, at least uh, focusing especially on land conservation and, and supporting projects to, to tackle the water quality problems that we have. Uh, if you can mix that in with, with whatever other issues you might be there to speak about. Uh, yeah, so I posted in the chat, um, if anyone is here from Marion or Putnam counties, um, and if you're, if you could go to your legislative delegation or have any interest, please contact me. I'll be sending an email out um, sometime in the next, well, probably next week. Yeah, and, and thanks for highlighting that. Uh, I was thinking we should, we should contact our members in those counties for, for whom we we have contact information, uh, because we are trying to coordinate. Uh, the speaking with the the Free the Oklawaha River Coalition. So uh, it's a lot more effective at a delegation meeting if you have uh, a big issue like Oklawaha restoration where the speakers are addressing different elements of the issue. You only get a few minutes to speak. And so we, we really want to try to coordinate uh, where any any members or speakers that we have present at those meetings will really be approaching it uh, largely from a, a native plant society perspective, just so that you're not repeating what what other speakers have said during your precious three minutes of airtime. Is there any precedent for like they do in county commission meetings? If there's too many speakers, they cut the time down for these. I, I think there is, there might be precedent for that. Uh, almost without fail, you have to sign up in advance. This is another important point. If you want to speak at, a, at your legislative delegation meeting, almost without fail, you have to register, sign up in advance to speak. So they have a, a sense for how many people will be speaking. And there's a cutoff date. If, if you haven't signed up, you know, as much as a week in advance of that meeting, you will not be allowed to speak. You won't have your three minutes. And they, they could always, if, if there are a whole lot of speakers, they could end the meeting early. I, I think that's happened a number of times. So uh, they take speakers first come, first serve. If you want to speak, uh, your, your chances are best if you sign up early to speak so that you're at, at the front of the list. Uh, Kimberly asks, can you tell us more about how FNPS works with a lobbyist to influence state lawmakers? Sure. Uh, I wish Sue could have been with us uh, 
I suspect she's somewhere around the Capitol in Tallahassee right now. Um, so she uh, has established relationships with quite a few of the legislators. Uh, they know who she is and uh, she is a, a registered lobbyist. It's necessary uh, to be registered like that if you're gonna represent an organization like the Native Plant Society. So she comes at this kind of work with quite a bit of experience. She and I were co-workers many, many moons ago at the Nature Conservancy. And uh, I worked in the state office. She worked in the Tallahassee office uh, doing work similar to what she's doing now, uh, but you know, for the Nature Conservancy. And, and she now works on her own. We are one of her clients. And uh, so she uses her, uh, her savvy, political savvy and contacts and access in order to go and advocate in support of Native Plant Society's issues. Uh, during the legislative session, our committee will often meet weekly, usually on Wednesday evenings. And that's because I, I already mentioned things move fast. Uh, things turn on a dime during the legislative session. And sometimes we've seen a bill that we really loved and were fully supportive of get amended in such a way that, uh, that we could no longer support it. And uh, it's one thing for us to be able to uh, send an action alert to our members and say, please call uh, your legislator or please call the governor's office and express your support for or your opposition to. Uh, and that there's a lot of value in that, but it takes time. And, and sometimes you just, you need somebody there who knows the process, uh, who knows the people, uh, who if, if you can't get FaceTime with the legislator, you know their their staff, their aides, and you know you're welcome in their office. They know who you are, and so it's 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 really much more effective uh, to advocate if you have someone like Sue there, an environmental professional, uh, who can represent you right there in the halls of the Capitol or in the governor's office. And uh, uh, just looking back at, at that last session, there was a bill 4508. It was horrendous. Uh, it really would have done a lot of damage to uh, land conservation in Florida, some of the things that it proposed. And I, I think it's safe to say Sue was very instrumental in convincing uh, the governor through his staff that he should veto that bill, and he he ultimately did. Uh, we were united. There were a lot of other conservation organizations. Virtually every single conservation organization in the state was was opposed to 4508. Uh, but Sue planted herself in the governor's office, and and she made it her mission to to convince them that that was a stinker of a bill that that he should veto. And it, you know, it was one of the highlights of the session that that horrible bill ended up being vetoed. So Melanie asks, how can we find out what properties in our counties should be added to the corridor? And so I asked her if she meant the Florida Wildlife Corridor, but that's my assumption. Yeah. Uh, well, and I didn't delve into that really. I, I guess a couple of the slides made a point that uh, the Florida Wildlife Corridor Act was passed by the legislature, not this last session, but the previous session, the, the 2021 session. And it, it really did put a spotlight on, on land conservation, focusing on lands within that corridor. What that corridor is, uh, there, there was a data set, is a data set called the Florida Ecological Greenways Network. And 
the Florida Natural Areas Inventory uses that uh, when they work with DEP, support DEP, uh, to identify lands that should be conserved. And that particular set of data is all about maintaining uh, or enhancing connectivity so that we would have a, a connected network of conservation lands. So you, you can't necessarily add land to the Florida Wildlife Corridor. That is a, a data set that is, is created using a, a lot of uh, GIS analysis. Uh, but it, it is instructive if you were to look at uh, the Florida Natural Areas Inventories interactive map. You can go to their website and use this map. It's a pretty valuable resource. It, it maps all of the approved Florida Forever projects, projects that the state has already evaluated, determined are valuable for conservation, and provided approval to DEP's staff to pursue uh, the purchase of those lands. And about 90%, I think, is the number of Florida Forever projects are within the, what's defined as the Florida Wildlife Corridor, now, the, the highest priority parts of that Florida Ecological Greenways Network. Now, just because you can't necessarily add lands to the Florida Wildlife Corridor doesn't mean that you can't propose lands to be added to the Florida Forever list. Uh, that's a process that happens every year. Uh, lands are nominated uh, to be Florida Forever projects and the DEP staff and Florida Natural Areas Inventory, they'll assess, assess those, those lands, evaluate them, and then uh, the Acquisition and Restoration Council, as it's called, uh, they, they review all that information and, and provide an updated Florida Forever project list. So it's, there's no guarantee that if you nominate a project, it would be added to the list, but that is how the process works. So, you know, in, in your local, in your county or your local neck of the woods, if there's a piece of property that you really think should be part of the Florida Forever program, uh, you can find information on how to nominate it right there on, on DEP's website. I encourage you to do so. Uh, and also, you know, one of the main things that, that, that you see uh, the Acquisition and Restoration Council do when they meet is uh, they look at changing the boundaries of Florida Forever projects. And in fact, in about a week, uh, the Acquisition and Restoration Council will have a meeting. You can attend it virtually, I think, by Zoom if you go to the, the website and, uh, and sign up to get the link. And they are gonna be reviewing proposed uh, boundary changes to Florida Forever projects. And there are at least five or six parcels that are being proposed to be added uh, to the project around uh, the, the Oklawaha River and Rodman uh, that restoration area. Uh, sometimes they, 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 they subtract lands if they are developed or, or otherwise no longer considered really appropriate for conservation. But uh, you can propose lands uh, to become Florida Forever Project areas. So, Long-winded answer, but I, I, I hope that provided enough information to answer a question. Yeah, that, that was really good. Thanks, Gene. Look, I have two things to add. Is that okay? Okay. So um, one, we had a, an after hours with Susan Carr that's, that we had, a, this is like a common question. What is going on with, um, you know, how do we do small scale land conservation and how does land conservation work in the state of Florida? And Susan is an absolute expert in land conservation in the state of Florida. Yes. And she gave a very good overview. And so a lot of the times when you're a person, an individual seeing properties, probably you should be looking at, you know, methods for smaller scale land conservation rather than Florida Forever, because Florida Forever is big, wild, and connected, and, uh, you know, not necessarily small, biodiverse, and right. rare. There, there is a funding formula that is kind of, I think, being ignored uh, 
for the funds that go to Florida forever. That a portion of that goes to the Florida Communities Trust program. It has historically, but they've been starving that program of funds. And that is that is a program, part of Florida Forever, that's designed to help local governments, local communities uh, protect smaller areas for for parks or natural resource values. But yes, organizations like uh, Susan Carr's local land trusts, mm -hmm. they're also extremely uh, valuable for being able to uh, tackle conservation projects that are that that really aren't part of Florida forever. Yeah. So if you're really interested in that, I recommend you go check out that after hours, and then you can send me and Susan questions. Uh, you know, come from that. And then I did put a link to that FNA. FNA does have a web map, an RGIS web map of the legislated Florida Wildlife Corridor boundary from 2021, and they have layers that turn on and off for all of the Ecological Greenways Network um, priorities. Yes. So do you mind if I show that to people? No, go ahead. I, I love using that map. If, if you don't have GIS, it's almost like having GIS at your fingertips, and you can see a lot of those data sets, uh, like the Florida Ecological Greenways Network, that are part of the Florida Forever Conservation Needs Assessment. And, uh, you know, it, it shows lands important for floodplain protection. It shows lands important for forestry. It shows lands that have really high uh, habitat conservation value. And, and really, it, I think it helps to underscore that Florida Forever is not some kind of haphazard uh, process. It is, it is really uh, firmly rooted in a science-based approach to land conservation, to really ensure that we're protecting the right lands. Yep, so I'm just uh, turning on and off layers, showing people that there's a Florida Wildlife Corridor layer, there's these up to priority five for the Ecological Greenways Network, there's existing conservation lands in gray, and there's RFLVP program projects, the Rural and Family Lands Protection Program projects that were that Jane discussed earlier. And then there's also a Florida Forever Project full boundaries so that you can see what those project boundaries look like and see if there's any in your area. Does, does it show the rural and family lands project areas? Yes, oh. in orange. Okay. And again, just so everybody, it's important to keep in mind that rural and family lands purchases conservation easements, not fee title, it keeps lands in agriculture. Mm -hmm. That was the intention of creating that program as a complement to Florida Forever. And they are in general less defensible from outside threats. Yes. To conservation usage. Um, is that GIS from the last link I posted? Yes, that's the last link. Yes. And you can find all of their um, mapping programs. You just type in fnai.org, fnai.org. That's the Florida Natural Areas Inventory. And then they have a little um, a little menu that you can go to their web map. So I just put their geodata.fnai.org and very user-friendly little maps. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a tremendous resource. The Florida Natural Areas Inventory website has a wealth of information and several different tools, really valuable if So um, we still have quite a number of people on, Jean. Um, if people are really interested and they want to talk to you about joining the committee or getting more involved uh, or maybe working on local chapter issues, how do they go about doing that? Uh, well, for starters, you contact me through that email address. Um, you know, we, we really are trying to explore how we can best support uh, chapters and members who want to be involved in advocacy on on their local level, because we know that there are uh, land development projects uh, proposed all you know every day. Florida is, is growing like gangbusters. Uh, we know that there are all kinds of threats out there to natural systems, to native plants and native plant communities that 
will never really be on our radar because we're focused on on state level and federal level projects. Sometimes local projects, if if they really seem uh, like they'll set some kind of really egregious precedent that would have statewide implications. But if people have questions or ideas about how we can more effectively help help you advocate, uh, please let us know. You know the communication needs to be a two way street. So, it, you know, I I'm really interested in in us being able to do a better job at at supporting the chapters and and individual members. But we're we're not really sure how to do that. <laughs> I mean, we're hoping that that advocacy handbook and 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 the policy statements and developing new policy statements will 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 help uh, chapters and members be more effective in advocating for their their issues. And of course, the idea also is to be be sure that we're all on the same page. Uh, that you know that that there isn't something uh, that we don't have a, a chapter or members doing something as part of their chapter that that would be contradictory with uh, the Florida Native Plant Society as a whole. All right, so Sue Egloff is inspired, so she'll be contacting us. She's in the villages. All right, so that is all. Uh, those are all the questions in the chat. Well, and we got it done in an hour. Got it done in an hour. This is very nice. Well, and, and if, again, if you have questions, comments, recommendations, please contact me. All right. Um, well, with that, I guess, Gene, everybody in the audience, I hope you guys have a great weekend. And happy holidays. Happy holidays. Thank you so much for everything, your expertise and leadership on this, Gene. My pleasure. I appreciate the interest. Yeah. Lots of folks on. Okay. Bye.